So today we will start with our Anastasia topic and that is hemodynamic monitoring. Okay. So <clears throat> what is hemodynamic monitoring? So by the end of this lecture, uh, you should know what is hemodynamic monitoring, why we do the hemodynamic monitoring, and how we do the hemodynamic monitoring. So what are the ways of the hemodynamic monitoring? And what are the methods of hemodynamic monitoring? But all we will discuss in short. Okay. So <clears throat> Hemodynamic monitoring is the study of interrelationship between the blood pressure, blood volume, vascular volume, heart rate, ventricular function, and the physical properties of blood. Because our circulatory system and respiratory systems are interdependent. Heart is the main, uh, <coughs> main organ who controls our hemodynamics of the body. So whenever we talk about heart or cardiac function, uh, you might have heard the terms like ejection fraction or ventricular function or uh, central venous volume. Uh, so blood pressure. First basic is the pulse rate and blood pressure. So whenever patient comes to our OPD or uh, have you your uh, clinical postings you must have seen the patient. What you do is first ask your patient about the complaints. That means you ask for the symptomatology of the patient. After taking complete history of the patient, you examine the patient. So that is the correlation of the symptoms to find out the signs from the patient. That is the general examination of the patient. And when we go to the systemic examination, we see every system wide. So in cardiovascular system, the clinical monitoring is pulse rate, blood pressure, isn't it? And in respiratory system, we see the respiratory rate, the respiration, type of respiration. So it is the clinical monitoring. After doing any clinical monitoring, you do the provisional diagnosis that this patient requires OPD treatment or he requires hospitalization or he is very unstable and he may require the ICU treatment. Once you take the patient in ICU, we have to do the meticulous monitoring of the patient and the hemodynamic monitoring is the basic of the critical care nursing in the ICU. So we should know about the details of hemodynamic monitoring. Now, as I just know to the importance of hemodynamic monitoring, it lies to diagnose whether really heart is not functioning properly or we have to do many drugs. We have to see the response of the drug by doing this hemodynamic monitoring. And then <clears throat> we can Accordingly, we can plan the treatment of the patient as well. We will know that the patient is going to be particularly urgent. Then we have to change the drug, etc. Now, in which patient you need hemodynamic monitoring? So, the mainly the patients who have cardiac decompensation. So, in simple words, cardiac failure patients. We have to have to do the hemodynamic monitoring. Next, if a patient in a respiratory distress also having shock, we can do the hemodynamic monitoring. In respiratory distress patient, we should know the oxygen concentration, oxygenation of the patient. And if you have heard the term arterial blood gas, so we can assess the treatment which we are giving for this respiratory condition. So there are many, many uses of the hemodynamic monitoring. So uh, as I told, any cardiac decompensation like acute myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure or patients with cardiomyopathy, we have to monitor them. Then many types of shock. 
you have heard cardiogenic shock septic shock neurogenic shock or anaphylactic shock in any type of shock there is cardiac dysfunction and we have to treat this cardiac dysfunction either with fluids or with the anthropic support and for that we need minute to minute monitoring of the cardiac function so cardiac function we with this hemodynamic monitoring the terminologies we use is the first is the blood pressure as you all of know the normal blood pressure is 
today's topic of discussion. Today we are basically discussing the invasive hemodynamic monitoring. And just remember, in invasive hemodynamic monitoring, we have to assess the central venous pressure, arterial blood pressure, and the pulmonary artery pressure. Now, for all these three monitors, monitoring, we need some uh, instruments or some gadgets. So, these all tubes, they are also called as catheters, arterial catheter, central venous catheter, or pulmonary artery catheter. Now, for these catheters, we need to connect the transducer system. So, now physics comes here. Okay. So, the, so the waves, the mechanical waves, because of the blood volume which produced in the body, either in the central venous system, or in the arterial blood pressure system or in the pulmonary arterial system, whatever the waves of mechanical waves of these blood going and coming, going and coming, these waves, they are transmitted to a transducer where they get converted into the electronic waves. This transducer amplifies into the electronic waves and then monitor gives us it in the figures. So a lot of physics is there and it is uh, not that important. You just have an overall idea how we uh, measure the pressures. Okay, so for these we require some pressure tubings like flush solutions, IV tubings and pressure bags to continuously flush this arterial system or venous system. If we don't flush, then the catheters we have put in the vicinity of our vessels, they get lots and then complications can happen. So we need a continuous flush system. So the pressure transducer, pressure amplifier, and a multi-parapardiac monitor. You must have gone into some ICUs or any cardiac OTs or in any OT or pressure theater. Okay, on a on a special machine, you must have seen a multi-para monitor. Multi-para means multiple parameters we can monitor on these monitors. So it called as multi-para monitors. So multi-para monitors gives you idea about ECG, blood pressure, central venous pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, saturation of the patient, internal carbon dioxide of the patient, then temperature of the patient, and everything which gives us a very, very clear picture about the patient's hemodynamics, whether patient is stable or getting unstable, we can immediately pick up and we can immediately treat to, to the patient. Now, leveling and zeroing is an integral part of all these uh, monitoring systems. As I told you, the physics is there. And you, you just remember that without zeroing, or it is also called as leveling, we can't proceed for the monitoring. Now, coming to the very simple, that is arterial pressure monitoring. So, all of you know that the blood pressure is uh, a uh, normal systolic blood pressure is 100 to 120 and diastolic 60 to 90 or 80 millimeters of the mercury according to the age of the patient. So, why do we need the continuous arterial blood pressure monitoring? As I told, there are many, many, many indications of these arterial blood pressure monitoring. In gross, if we say that whenever there is neurodynamic instability, then the hemodynamic instability is of many causes like cardiac dysfunction, acute heart patient with heart attack, or uh, severe shock because of the trauma, accident, bleeding, or uh, any embolism, pulmonary embolism, or uh, any uh, other uh, sepsis, very severe motion dilatation, or if you are given any patient any injection and anaphylactic shock, it present as shock. So, any hemodynamic instability, we require to monitor the blood pressure continuously with arterial blood pressure. So, an arterial line, it is just a cannula, usually we put in the 
peripheral artery so what are the sites you can put it in the radial artery you can put it in the femoral artery which we use commonly but there are many other arteries or sites are there which you can try for the hemodynamic monitoring artery and that is the brachial artery which is rarely used in dorsal spadic artery which also we rarely used only when we don't have a option to put the radial or femoral because of trauma because of burns anything in that situation only we go for this brachial and dorsal spadic artery but OTB we choose to calibrate the radial artery or femoral so what are the uses of the arterial blood pressure monitoring and i told you that uh, minute to minute continuous blood pressure monitoring and second the most use use of this arterial cannula is to take the abg samples when you are patients on ventilator patients of ards or respiratory failure we need to assess their oxygenation because oxygenation in, at the tissue level, at the organ level, is very, very vital for the functioning of the organ. And these oxygenation we manage with the ventilator settings. But whenever we do ventilator settings, are they in the right path or not? Whether there is improvement in the patient's lung function or not? How will we come to know? We will come to know only with the arterial blood gas analysis that is in short called ABG. So this sampling we have to take again and again from the artery. So if you put a cannula, it is very easy to aspirate the ABG sample and give our lead to our protocol. So no need to pick again and again and no need uh, that there should be any experienced person always to take the blood sample. Sister who is trained enough, she can aspirate from the arterial cannula with due precautions. So, what are the complications? The complications, as I told, these are the invasive procedures, the complications in Moresh. So, if you go to the artery very badly, very roughly, then there can be a tremendous Moresh. Uh, inside and hematoma can form. So we have to be very, very careful. Systematically, we have to go. <coughs> then blockage. As I told, we need a pressure back system to continuously flush the system. Otherwise, what will happen? The blood will be stagnant into the hollow catheters and there will be clot formation. So this blood we have to flush continuously and that's why we need pressure back. So keep pressure bag inflated to allow some pressure. We keep 300 millimeters of mercury and continuous flushing is going on. So we can avoid blockage, clotting, and air lines. <clears throat> now, whenever we are putting the cannula, so per se, you say that you are putting the radial artery or in the femoral artery, we have to monitor the distinct perfusion when we put the cannula. If I have put it in the radial artery, then I have to monitor my hand. Because if you know all that there is ulnar and radial artery. So in some some patient if ulnar artery is already blocked, we don't know and you have catheter the radial. Now what happened? There will be compromise to the forward flow of radial artery. There is no ulnar artery supply. And what will happen? Your hand will start ischemia. So blood flow will be less and then slowly, slowly there will be signs of ischemia. So continuous monitoring of the distal link where you put the arterial cannula is much. So the warmth of the distal limb color of the distal beam, saturation of the distal beam, we have very important monitoring after putting the radial or femoral or any arterial line. So since the start of lecture, we are talking about the pressure, cardiac monitoring. So what are the normal pressures of the heart chambers? So you know the term CVP, that is central venous pressure, and the right atrial pressure. The central venous pressure is like the right atrial pressure and what is the right atrial pressure? The normal right atrial pressure is 
is above the range, then we have to restrict the fluid. If it is below the range, we have to give the fluid. So it is very easy monitoring and we can give the fluid. Okay, then comes to the right ventricular chamber. So the pressure of right ventricular chamber is pulmonary artery arises from the right ventricle. Pulmonary circulatory system is a low resistance system. The SVR, there is no much SVR as compared to the systemic vascular resistance. So the pulmonary system having a low resistance, and that's why the RV does not require to generate more pressures like left ventricle. So the right ventricular pressures are just 50 to 30 millimeters of mercury and that's to make a very low that is to be weight is equal to RA pressures. Now coming to the pulmonary artery catheter. So the pulmonary artery pressures, pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery divides into right and left pulmonary artery and again it divides into many capillary Okay, so we have to take the main pulmonary artery pressure and the capillary pressure. So we term it as pulmonary capillary base pressure. So what is pulmonary artery pressure? It is normal range is 50 to 30 millimeters of systole. So if the pressure is above 30 millimeters of mercury, it indicates that the pulmonary arteries are full. So what is the meaning of pulmonary arteries are full? Again, the RARB is overloaded and that's why pulmonary arteries are full. So we need to restrict the volume. Sometimes the left ventricular dysfunction also reflect backward pressures into the pulmonary circulation and it gives us an increased pulmonary artery pressures irrespective of the low central venous pressure. That is, we can diagnose that there is some left ventricular dysfunction and here is the importance of pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. So central venous pressure monitoring and pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. And the last third is the arterial blood pressure monitoring, which we monitor at the peripheral vascular. So you should know these pressure range. Left ventricular pressure, what is the left ventricular pressure? It is limited to one point. So it is the systolic pressure which we measure at the arm. <clears throat> now coming to the central venous catheterization. Till now we have seen the arterial catheterization. Now, see how we do the central venous pressure monitoring. So, central venous pressure monitoring, so indication again, when we have to do volume resuscitation, patient is acute cardiac dysfunction, patient is in shock, he needs volume, or patient needs many anthropods, fossil dilators, whatever the drugs he needs. We have to put the central venous pressure line so that the direct drugs will go into the central circulation. Sometimes some chemotherapy patients, they, they don't have any peripheral vascular access. In that case, we need to put the central venous line. Burn patients when they don't get peripheral vents at the site because of the burn areas, because of the infection, we have to put the central venous lines. So these are mostly some indications of the central venous catheters in the patient. So what are the contraindications? In which conditions we should not put the central venous catheter? The site we have decided if that site is having absolute indications, absolute contraindications with the site is having the infection. So clear cut infection and the site of the infection is the absolute contraindication of putting the central venous catheterization. If your patient is conscious or awake and is not giving consent to put the central venous catheter, you cannot put the central venous catheter to the patient. That is the relative contraindication. Other relative contraindications during the service. As we are doing it in for blind procedure, the patient is having deranged clotting time, bleeding time, and we are poking to the patient. Inside, hematomas can form. And these hematomas have pressure effect on other structures which can be 
danger is okay. Better to the light. So, getting the shoulder plate patient for anticoagulation may be distorted local anatomy, meaning they cannot see proper, uh, cannot examine. So, to put the central vein catheter is very difficult. You can, you can stop using the central catheter. Now, what will be the complication? These are the complications to any invasive procedures. As you are doing directly putting the uh, <clears throat> vessel, so direct air can go into the vestibular system and air embolism can happen. You are trying to uh, puncture the vein, but accidentally you can puncture the arterial, arteries surrounding the vein. So, arterial puncture. After putting and because of the procedure, there can be formation of arterial veins, tissue lines, the hematoma, blood clots. If you are not using proper sterility during the procedure, the patient can have infection source, your catheter can be source of infection, the patient can land it into the bacteria and set the same way. Then some uh, miscellaneous complications like they putting the guide wire and putting the central venous catheter, this linear can occur. That the uh, catheter can be misplaced and get not. So you cannot measure the pressure as well as you cannot give the drug as well. Then the more as you are doing it in blindly and into the cavity, then the more can occur. So it is a or it is a protocol that you should take the x ray after doing central venous or pulmonary artery examination. You should take x ray after two hours. Now, there are many techniques how to do it, but routinely we use a Seldinger technique. What is the Seldinger technique? This man has perfectly devised a technique uh, by guiding technique. You have to first puncture the vein, then you put the guide wire and through this guide wire you pass your catheter. This is the simple sending the technique. Uh, it has some steps which we follow on the all effective precaution and we put. So this is a pictorial um, steps. How to put first you have to clean the skin, then put the uh, then needle puncture, then put the guide wire after guide wire you will put introduce a shape, dilate it, and then put your catheter. Now there are three sites as the radial artery and tumoral artery are the two sites which we commonly uh, use for the arterial pressure monitoring, for central venous pressure monitoring also there are three, three sites that is internal jugular vein, tumoral vein and supply vein vein. So internal jugular vein is the most preferred vein because it is very superficial. The landmarks are very easy to recognize and the complications compared to the subclavian vein are very different. That's why we use internal jugular vein access. <clears throat> and the third, which is also commonly used Height is a pivotal vein. Pivotal vein is also very easy to calibrate, very easy to identify, and very easy to manage also. And yes, uh, chances of uh, complications are there, but the deep venous thrombosis, if the venous catheter is blocked in your way, then the downward limb cannot have venous drainage and so there can be formation of the clot and venous thrombosis can be there. But it is very, very rare complication as we uh, always take precautions with paralyzation and pressure and pressure back system and continuous flush system. So femoral vein is also uh, easy. But if you want to and we are talking about the femoral vein complications, yes, or disadvantage that when you want to ambulate the patient with fibular vein, it is very difficult. So, most preferred site is internal jugular vein. Subclavian vein is also very good, but it has the most common complication of pneumothorax, and that's why we give it as a second choice compared to the internal jugular vein. Now this is uh, pictorial uh, how to 
food. The catheter is the subclavian vein. Below clavicle, there is subclavian vein. You have to palpate, locate it at the junction of middle um, two third and lateral one third, and you have to take the three. So when you are taking it, you are very, very near to the apical fibula, and that's where the chances of pneumothorax are very, very high with this approach. Now, as I told, in the jugular approach, it is very, you know, very much preferred and very easy. So you have to do position of the uh, standing work. That means you have to do 10 to 15 degrees. And your patient, you know, because of this position, the volume will come in central lumbar position. That is the head down and leg up. So as you are doing leg up, the volume comes into the central circulation, central veins. And that's why the vein gets distended and it is easy to locate after getting this tension. So never forget to give the frontal and not position to the patient. After locating, you have to, uh, uh, of course, under all effective precaution, cleaning and dressing the new part should be done. And you have to locate the very well, key approach you can do with central approach and medial or posterior approach. So this is the anatomy. See, in this picture, you can clearly see the internal jugular vein is lateral and carotid artery is immediately medial to the vein. It is in the carotid sheet. Isn't it? So, if you are very near, the you know, puncture is very, very medial, you can accidentally uh, puncture the carotid artery. It's good if you can identify that you have punctured the carotid artery, then you will immediately remove your needle and do pressure for one minute gently so that the venous not will not form. But if you are beating a you are not monitored by the senior and you puncture the carotid artery and you cancelate the carotid artery, then just imagine what will happen. The venous not will not be First and foremost, thing does you not go easily because arterial pressure is very high. So there will be resistance to any drugs or any IV fluid to go inside the vessel, and you will see the backward flow. So never can you get any carotid arteries or any artery as considering it is in the central vein. So this is internal jugular approach. It's very easy. Uh, if you want to see, you can come in cardiac OP and you can see there are a lot of videos also uh, about the radial articulation and um, sensory balance calibrations also. And the videos are also uh, my videos are also available uh, in Excel also our MGH uh, Excel. Uh, there are dummies on which we can show you the, how to calibrate the bed arteries. Now the last part of today's humanic monitor. This is the pulmonary catheter which we use in the cardiac operation theaters or in the ICUs when the patient has severe cardiac dysfunction. It has five units. You can see First is a very small and red lumen. It is to inflate the balloon. There is balloon at the tip. Here there is a transparent balloon, and this is a balloon inflating lumen. And these lumens, these key lumens, are the lumens for monitoring the central pulmonary artery pressures and to give the drugs. So in these these two events we can use to do the different types of drugs like adrenaline, dopamine, dopamine or NTT. And you can see a big lumen and a something which cap red cap and that is a system which we connect to the transducer so that the mechanical waves to this transducer, the temperature of the blood, it's all analyzed through the machine. It is called as continuous cardiac output machine or monitor. And we see the continuous pulmonary artery pressures and the cardiac function of the patient. As I told in the immediate uh, 
flight there are cardiac index to volume and after they all have their some normal values and with this um, Women, if we connect to the continuous cardiac output monitor, we can assess all the values continuously and we can treat the patient. So, this is a picture tail form. How we put pulmonary artery catheter, we put to the internal tubular vein. So, whatever the contraindication and uh, related contraindication applicable for the central venous catheterization are applicable for the pulmonary artery catheter also. So we have to put the pulmonary artery catheter to the intermediate vein and we have to pass it towards the pulmonary artery. See this is totally a blind procedure with the monitor and the waveform we pass this catheter as I told there are different pressures in the RA, RB and PA. So because of these different pressures, there will be different arterial impairments. So we can assess that now this wave is in the catheter in the RA. So wave changes. Waveform changes, we can see that we are in the RB. Then again waveform changes and then we can conclude that we are in the pulmonary artery catheter. So, this is a tutorial on how the pulmonary artery catheter and volume is inflated here. So, these are the movements. So, this fourth movement is distal core. Third movement, it opens here. And second movement, so goes to the thermistar. Which thermistar means it goes to the cardiac output monitor and goes along the cardiac analysis. So, this is all about our today's hemodynamic monitoring in short. So any queries, any problems, you can ask me on my email or you can directly uh, give me message on my mobile numbers. So take care, stay at home, stay at home. Thank you.